I came from a Catholic background in Coventry. I was there in the Blitz. It's come to me that my love for abstract sounds came from the air raid silence, then the sound of the all clear. That was electronic music. It started off as a byproduct of another project I was working on involving Mogwai playing in, in this cathedral and we were looking about having some incidental music before they came on stage. So I was trying to link Mogwai to the, you know, the terroir of Coventry, the place, the space, and the person I thought would be perfect was Delia Derbyshire. Chunk Records had recently reissued an undiscovered film of hers and Isa Stanfield. I got in touch with Johnny Trunk, who runs Trunk Records. I had this idea of screening the film in the cathedral. So, um, sit back or stand back and... Um... Knowing that her 80th birthday was impending the next year to screen the film, maybe have 10, 15, 20 people turn up. Johnny Trump emailed back, yeah, of course, you can do the screening, love to do it in a hometown. And then one day he emailed back saying, oh, I've got a friend who might, would like to DJ. And I was like, okay, who, who's that? He said, Jerry Dammons has always wanted to play Delia's music in the cathedral. See, once you've got the nucleus of, of a night, a celebration, it evolved and we started thinking about getting other people. It was going to be Johnny Trump, Jerry and Hal Round. And then we just started thinking, well, maybe we should get someone else to play, and I started thinking about getting Sonic Boom to play. to Sonic Boom, but I did know that the Tin and some of the Curious promoters had about a year before put Sonic Boom on. As this thing was snowballing and getting bigger and bigger by the week, I thought, right, let's get some other people involved. I was shifted to Preston, where my parents came from. I was taken to benediction, and it was all in Latin, plain song hymns in an abstract language. I realized that the sound of clogs on cobbles must have been such a big influence on me. That percussive sound of all the mill workers going to work at six o'clock in the morning. With the way that Delia would have worked, a very, very important part of what she would have done is the ability to listen, the ability to listen and respond. And, you know, in, as a first instance, actually identifying that a sound that you've got is worth capturing and manipulating. So that was what, part of what we were trying to do. We were trying to encourage the, the kids to, to listen to what was around them. You know, they know what their, what their palette of sound is and, and they could then contribute their sounds into that into the music and you know decide what you like and then capture it and use it. I think the ability to listen is is, uh, is
is incredibly important in creating music, particularly this type of music. Yeah, and seeing what comes out as well. Because mm. I, I was quite keen to just see what comes out. The not just mm. the instrument, the, when I say the instrument, the sound. What comes out of it by the time you put it on pads mm. and you've detuned it and you've layered it a few times, you've put a few wrong loops well, in that's it, and it just gets all glitched and that, kind of that was really another thing. That was another thing that we discussed. The distortion um, as well. We, 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 we had ideas for the project, but very early on we decided that actually that the approach that we should take is that each school should really take their project in the direction that they want it to. Not all music's the same and I used to think there was only like one kind of music but now that I've heard her music it makes me think about different makes me think differently about all kinds of music to be honest like pop music isn't always as it seems like there's always different sounds in there that she's made me see we decided to do the Deliophonic event. Um, you know, we started to talk about what that would be, where it would be, and who, who we could invite to play. And very quickly, I suggested that we do a schools project because it, it's something that Synth Curious had always wanted to do. I know it's something that Sarah from the Tin had always wanted to do. And it just, it seemed perfect. It just seemed absolutely ideal that it was a way of educating people about Delia, introducing people to Delia's work. And, and by using some of the methods that she would have used, or you know, the modern day equivalent of that, we could actually, you know, roll this out, you know, take it into schools and uh, and, and have some fun with it. it. It was very much about getting the kids involved, getting them hands on. Like myself, Delia worked a lot with found sounds. So when we talk about found sounds, we mean making sounds from objects that you wouldn't consider musical. And so she was very tuned in to sound and sound design, as well as being musical. She brought those two worlds together. So for example, her most favourite instrument, her favourite instrument was known to be the Kulikon lampshade, which she found in Mayville, I think, BBC. And um, it's got a lovely gonging quality. I think electronic music, again, is a way in that's um, playful, it's in it's in an interface that kids can seem to be able to connect with quite easily via iPad at the same time as they are going right back to the roots of all that tape looping, sampling, tape looping, sampling and manipulating samples. Tape looping, sampling, tape looping, sampling, tape looping, sampling. I arrived in Manchester about the same time as Delia's archive did in 2007 and um, I was booked to play at a festival that used to be called Future Sonic and um, the person who was sort of the artist liaison person, um, Telis Rennie, said to me, you do realise that one of the godmothers of electronic music, her archives, just arrived in Manchester. And I was like, wow. <laughs> no, and wow. And it took me about 18 months to pluck up the courage as a non-academic to approach the university and sort of say, oh, I'd like to do something with this. Could I do something? And, um, yeah, and met the wonderful David Butler, who's the most approachable <laughs> person, let alone academic, you could meet. And just sort of said to him, I'm really interested in maybe female artists, not just electronic, but female artists looking at Delia's work and seeing how that inspires new work for them. It goes back to the early 2000s, and it's Mark Ayers who had um, helped to salvage the Rayfront Workshop archive. He'd been so surely um, working with that archive, cataloguing it, and, um, and was beginning to prepare um, releases of um, various projects, Rayfront Workshop projects on CD. And this started off with um, Doctor Who um, scores and sound effects. And so I just finished my PhD, um, uh, which is about film music. And so I just got in touch with Mark. I essentially, just wrote him a fan letter and, and basically said, you know, like, how much I really loved his own work as a composer for Doctor, but also to really um, appreciate what he was doing with the really fun workshop. And was there some way in which the university could help? And so he got back in touch and said that that the BBC were retaining ownership, but there was this other archive which had recently been entrusted to him and um, maybe we might be interested in doing something with that and this was Delia's archive and then in 2007 everything was in place for the archive to come to Manchester. The initial archive was mainly tapes and then paper documents all relating to Delia's primarily her freelance work and then there's things in there which you can't even be certain that they're by Delia. Um, there's there's off-air recordings of uh, music or copies of LPs um, 
And your initial reaction when you listen to that stuff is to go, oh no, that's, because there's 267 tapes. And you're hoping initially that every tape is gonna be another, you know, lost dealing in work. Just the beginning. He said, yeah, that sounds like a nice idea. And we sort of took, then, so I then invited Naomi Kashiwagi and Eilish Nguyen um, to come on board. And Eilish is a classical composer and Naomi's more of a sort of sound visual artist. So um, the three of us commissioned, um, we got Arts Council funding to commission ourselves to write a response to Delia's archive. And then also uh, it was Ailish's idea, well, let's make a day of it, let's do a symposium, let's, and then we came up with the Delia Derbyshire Day idea. She had different tape machines and she could play them together, which is really, really, really nice. She played all my instruments, didn't she? Yeah. She kind of mixed them. Like DJ. Yeah, almost. yeah, which no one really, is, you know, it's really, really hard to do. When we did the first Delia Derbyshire Day in 2013, we thought it would just sort of be a one-off, really. And it was so popular and there was so much interest and demand, we realised that there's a bit of mileage in what we're doing. And I approached One Education Music and um, they were actually advertising for music tutors. And I asked a friend, oh, do they do music technology? And she was like, yeah, I think there's a couple of guys who do music technology. So I went to the interview and just got on really well with Lindsay Thomas, the head of One Education Music, and was telling her about my projects that, you know, that I'd quite like to start doing education pilot in school. Dealing Derbyshire Day began, first of all, as a one-off event, which uh, goes back to 2013. And I was approached by Carol Churchill about an event that she was wanting to organise which would celebrate Delia's work. And in particular, it would be uh, a series of um, new pieces, new commissions. And so Carol had formed a trio. Their name at the time was Delia Darlings. And uh, the three works were very different in style. So um, uh, Carol's was much more electronic based and more in a kind of sort of more of a dealing aesthetic in terms of perform live as she was performing she was generating sounds and then sampling those sounds and manipulating them live and that was at band on the wall uh, in manchester and uh, it was a great success they sold out so i think the feeling from carol from that was you know there was more that could be done and certainly from my point of view with the archive i was thrilled to bits that this was happening because I'd always wanted, when the archive first came here, I, I said that, you know, I, I wanted it to be a living, breathing archive. In other words, that it was going to continue to generate new work. But it was quite important. We didn't want these pieces to be slavishly derivative of Delia. I think the principle of Delia Derbyshire Day was, sorry to celebrate her, but we don't just want people to be creating like Delian clones. And I know Carol feels this very strongly. It's very important to me as well, that we feel that that would not be respecting Delia's innovative, idiosyncratic nature. You kind of need to find a way in. Unfortunately, with Delia, there is a way in with kids and it's Doctor Who. Mm. Certainly the most famous thing that she did. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic piece of music. We, you know, wh whatever your tastes are, it is an incredible piece of music. Not the best thing she did, in my humble opinion, but I, you know... They're, I, they're all non-existent. That's the thing for her. The things, yeah, like, things like They're non-existent. They didn't exist. Yeah, they... Th things, things like Blue Veils is just wonderful. I, I would urge anybody to look beyond the, the handful of pieces of hers that, that they know and to look at some of her more obscure music and the methods which composition, are... Composition, because it's yeah. not the first chorus, first chorus. Mm. It doesn't have to be. And the methods of composition and the understanding of the composers from that period in time, the 50s and the 60s, really did filter into modern music. Absolutely. It's inspiring. It's good because we could show them techniques that Dina used, so kind of changing pitch and reversing things, and you know, her, some of her methods that, that we can translate to garage band on the, on the iPad. So it's very, it's quite instant in some in some senses but also you know you do find you know, 
out. So I mean, people can really get into it and they can really sort of experiment with the sounds. I find that the tools that we use or that I've chosen to use seem to be quite intuitive and the kids pick them up quite quickly. So what happens is they, towards the end of the fight week course, you know, so on the penultimate session, I'll say to them, good news, bad news. Bad news is it's our last week, next week, and they'll go, ah. and then the good news is you won't need me anymore. And then some of them have actually asked to set up lunchtime clubs or after school clubs, or they've wanted to keep it going, or they'll be ambassadors or champions of um, teaching electronic music to other years in the school. We had the sounds loaded up. We had, we had mini keyboards. We also had trigger pads. I think we had seven or eight of those. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which, which, There's you know, obviously. Six on this. There's three of the um, three pads Apoi trigger pads. Yeah. And then three of the Apoi actual keyboard. Yeah. Keyboards or, or the proper keyboard. Yeah. invited the schools at one at a time. Obviously they were playing the sounds that they had created and we'd, e we'd even labelled the keyboards so that we could actually give the pupils the sounds that they had actually created themselves, which again was really important to them and to us as well. Because they, they, they continue, each, each of the sessions, the, the each of the sessions built up, because each time we'd be recording sounds and they'd be playing with those sounds, each of the sessions built up over, over a period of time to be kind of workshops in that they'd be performing and using those sounds run pretty used to it, and have control and use them as a, as, as a sort of, um, collectively as a little group as well. So the, the, um, each of the performances were each definitely their own, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was definitely focused on what they created and recorded. None of it was rehearsed in that sense. There was no actual music, pre-rehearsed music that they were performing. Uh, what, we'd, what we'd sort of said to them is, and again, this is something we were teaching. We were teaching them to listen to what was what was around them. We were saying, you know, listen to what's being played and respond accordingly. It's sort of it's strange when you're working with sounds. You don't sort of compose it, do you? It sort of happens. You kind mm. of, it's, a, it's an element of response to what takes place at all yes. times, isn't it? We were, we, were, we were trying to free up their... We were trying to break down some of their musical ideals that they would have had and, and just get them to take and a free approach to it. And yeah. responding as a musician is, is, the, is the kind of working as a team in a group of people is in response to the sounds that you hear was, was really important as well because that's helped them to develop a musical, a musical understanding of I'm not really playing an instrument but, but it is an instrument because it's a sound source that you create and manipulate but you take away the instrument itself and the kids are playing the sounds and it very quickly you would find that the that the kids would want to own the sounds yeah. that they're creating. The physics teacher refused to teach us acoustics, but I studied it myself and did very well. It was always a mixture of the mathematical side and music. Radio had been my love since childhood because I came from just a humble background with relatively few books. Radio was my education. I went to Cambridge to read mathematics, which was quite something for a working class girl from Coventry. I managed to persuade the authorities to allow me to change to music, much against their judgment. One has to impose discipline and the discipline of numbers is an excellent discipline. You need to have discipline in order to be truly creative. To me, it's still exploring and trying to find something new. And I, and I think, you know, science, mathematics, I think, and art, there's always something that links together. There's always that kind of exploration and curiosity that inventors, like I consider her an inventor, need to have to kind of break the boundaries, to move on, to move forward, to be independent thinker, which she was. I suppose that every night I go to bed with a problem. 
and I think I shall solve it. I tried to communicate with Delia, and I also tried to communicate with Mendelssohn. But um, Mendelssohn was no good, he just said, get on with it. And when I suggested to Delia that I'd like to try and do something as if we had collaborated 50 or whatever it was years ago, she said, well, just get on with it however you like. And so this is called Jolly Fidelia, and it's how I like. In those days, it would be how I would type out the bit of code needed to achieve something. Now it would be much more visually looking at the screen and seeing where I will put the pointer and should I slow this down or speed it up. It's so the Synth Curious guys are very keen to put Dr. Peter Zinn off on. I personally had never heard of, heard of him. It was one of these moments like, uh, where we were sat in a meeting and they're like, oh, we want to put this guy, would be perfect. And they're expecting me to know who he is. And I'm just like, sorry, I've got no idea who he is. Apologies. Googled him. OK, he invented sampling. Yeah, he, he'll do. Now, this was the heady time when computers were so primitive. My computer had 4K of memory, which is approximately a thousand million times less memory than I've got now. It had no hard drive. So when I got a hard drive, which cost the equivalent of 100,000 pounds, this first computer cost 100,000 pounds in today's money. It had just the teletype and no screen and just this 4K of memory. And I've now got the beginning of a tenth of a hundredth of a petabyte of storage, you know, which is completely gigantic. When I started out, I started out using hardware only and I've only switched to using Laptop Live for our first, for my um, Delia Derbyshire Day commission in 2013. Up to that point, I really liked the hardware and I liked the physicality of it. I had drum machines, I had samplers, I had effects, I had synthesizers on stage and microphone. And But they got to a point where I was like, mm, I don't really want to use these presets or even mess with these presets, I actually want to be able to, to create my own sounds and sculpt yeah, yeah. my own sound. So if we record everyone say their names or something, then we can play it back. I was thinking something a bit more exciting. Three and three quarter inches, that's back. Let's see what we get. <laughs> so I had massive great oscillator chords playing. I also had had the heartbeat of my whippet playing, and my child aged five reciting something which he knew nothing about. My friend has a cabin there that belongs to her grandparents. And after dark, there's not much to do there. It's cold, it's dark, there's bears. You know, so you can't really go out much after the bar's shut. So I went around her little, this little cabin looking for sounds that made, for things that made interesting noises. And um, that and the fact that I was a bit hungry led me to the kitchen. And uh, I started opening and closing cupboards and drawers and things. And this is the sound of a drawer. It's on rollers, mm -hmm. you know, these old fashioned ones are. And when you pull it out, it goes like that.
way Delia worked was complex. At the same time, it was sort of there was there's fundamental sound manipulation and sound recording um, techniques really. So um, basically, what we do when we deconstruct the Doctor Who theme. Um, as a starting point, as a springboard for inspiration and musical education. It's very much about like, it's the loops, it's the samples, and it's the non-music, non-traditional musical instrumentation, really. After my degree, I went to the careers office. I said I was interested in sound, music, and acoustics, to which they recommended a career in deaf aids or depth sounding. So I applied for a job at Decca Records. They told me they didn't employ women in the recording studio. When I started out, especially performing in Newcastle, it was most of the sort of local media coverage I was getting was mentioning my gender and mentioning me being the only woman or doing live electronic stuff at that time. And it did get to a point where I was like, maybe I need to check whether it's really about my music or whether it's just a novelty of me getting on stage. So that's why I went to Berlin for a couple of years to sort of test that out really because it's just no marketing point whatsoever. <laughs> You're a woman doing, out there doing stuff because there's loads of experimental women doing stuff. It was actually while I was in Berlin in the days of MySpace that a very good friend, a DJ, had Delia Darbshire as one of her top friends. And I was like, oh, who's that? I've seen this black and white photo and then discovered her music and was just like, wow, I'm not the only one making weird sounds. <laughs> But also realising that, yeah, there's a lineage, really. You know, that, yeah, I might be in a small percentage of, um, of, you know, professional musicians, but there's a lineage. What makes this whole celebration really important, and especially being a female artist as well in today's industry, is that Delia was a really amazing role model and has been for me for probably the last four or five years in terms of someone to look to and be able to admire and there's not that many out there that you can really connect with and I like her inventiveness and curiosity. It's hard because there isn't anyone really to look up to. There's, there's a lot of men and there's a lot of artists and there's, you know, you've got David Bowie to look up to, you've got there's so many people that are male, but women you could probably count on your hand, like Kate Bush, Laurie Anderson, Delia Derbyshire, Daphne Ram. For me, that's it. Like, I'd, I'd love to find more, and I'd love that the next generations are given more confidence so that because there will be more people they can talk to. And I think ultimately, you, maybe you have got to be better, a bit like Delia and Daphne, maybe you have got to be make sure you're really on top of your game, especially as the sound engineer and all that sort of thing. Um, but I like to think that ultimately you'll be respected for what you do and who you are. And, you know, some of those barriers are internal. And obviously there's, there's societal barriers that become internal, which I think for women is generally confidence. It all comes down for confidence. And I also think that doesn't do men any favours because they're not allowed to be unconfident. <laughs> One of the things that inspired this box was just paper punch cards made with a hole puncher. So really, really basic mathematics. <laughs> Well, there's, there's definitely a great divide in the music industry still, and there's a lot of hard work to do. I think there's various things to, to why, and a lot of it's to do with confidence and having an idol to kind of, you know, learn off, mentors to learn off that are already out there doing it. I think the generation, my generation, will probably be the mentors for the younger generation in 20, 30 years' time, and, and they'll have someone to look to and talk to. And, you know, for me, to look up to Delia Derbyshire and what she represented and what she had to go through, um, if only she could know how much she's influenced everybody else. I mean, you know, and, and the same with a lot of people like Daphne Aram that she worked, you know, that were part of that same radiophonic workshop, that actually they are the people that have really carved out something to work towards. It was always 
is my little ambition to get into the BBC. The radiophonic workshop was credited with doing fantastic sounds for broadcast programmes. People weren't generally allowed to work at the workshop for more than three months at a time. They thought it would send people crazy. Well, it's a beautiful way to be crazy, I can tell you. Any mechanism which is supposed to tell time must be based on some periodic motion, something that repeats itself over and over again. This is just a sort of radiophonic workshop thing for a, for a Shakespeare production, a discussion on Shakespeare. So much of what Delia did was for the BBC and was going into the you know, the general public's front rooms um, virtually every Saturday afternoon in the 1960s because of that particular theme tune. Um, you know, the Doctor Who being there throughout the 60s, regularly. Um, and so that just goes into the soundscape of people's lives and, and puts deep roots in people's psyche. I remember the first time I heard the work of the BBC Radiophonic, for instance, but I do remember as a very, very young child, uh, you know, listening to those or watching those programmes for mm. schools and colleges and, and, and hearing this music, which was, which was just absolutely baffling. You, you had, it, it, it was a struggle to realise what had generated it. Or where it came and from. And where it, it came from. And, and it, was, it, was, yeah. it was challenging in that way. And, you know, I'm sure some people would have listened to it and and giving it no more thought. But I remember, as a small child, starting to wonder how it was created. Now, it was very difficult to make any meaningful music there. I tried to, to have lots of different patch panels, and in the end, I invented this matrix pin method I found in an old junk shop in London. I literally, there must be 20, 30 miles of cables behind all this. And that was hopeless. You know, what you could pull a wire from somewhere and you could make one sound recorded, it was impossible. In those days, there was no screen. So all you need is a teletype and type in, or a paper tape and let it churn through. And lo and behold, the knobs would turn, as it were, automatically. That was the difference between a studio like that and the next type of studio, which was me just sitting at a teletype. It was a huge change. Now, if I put Delia Derbyshire in front of that teletype, she would have had no idea what to type. She'd been used to turning controls and cutting up tape. But here, there wasn't any tape to cut up. So what we're going to do now, was basically we're going to use these to show you how to make tape loops. So, for this we will need an editing block, a razor blade, and some sticky tape. So you get this uh, sort of wax pencil, which on a big reel to reel tape machine like that, you, you rock the tape back and forth, and when, when the sound you want is over the uh, playhead, mm -hmm. this little thing, Make you do exactly that. You draw a little mark on the tape itself. So you edit by a sort of pulling it back and forth. So the sound, you find the start of the sound by going Tape is one of the more significant elements that de define in our age as well as far as music is concerned, isn't it? Because the more track recorder... I think, the, I, think, I think the advent of tape just basically took us to a point where anything mm. that makes a noise mm. yeah. can be used to create. Well, you can record it freely, yeah. quickly, and then, then slow it down readily mm -hmm. and overlay them as well with sound on sound. Normally you want the exact spot, because the tiniest little difference can make all the difference. So that is where we started. I'll find the other sound we've all recorded together. So we use this tiny little uh, splicing tape to make a, a little join. And if you imagine, most all the uh, radiophonic music you heard last night was the result of this, this over and over. So if you wanted the note C, you would have, and you had I don't know, 20 C's in your composition, you'd have to do it 20 times. Mm -hmm. Hang these 
I need a bit of C, chop that, stick that. Maybe I need an F. Okay, so we've got yeah. twin and cut them right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's that lampshade down. So then, what's great about which I couldn't believe, Garage Band is now free, and um, with this, it's a pitch shifting sampler. So you've got that original note somewhere around there, but you can then make a melody out of that by just playing. So for Delia's, in Delia's day, for example, she obviously didn't have this. She was using tape, so each little sample would be one little block of tape, and she would increase or decrease the speed of that, which would then change the pitch, how high or how low the sound is. Basically, every time you half the speed of the tape, you take it down by an octave, which is lucky. Should try. Should try. Yeah, so let's take it down a couple more. So flip it down, so half of 19 is 9.5. So as Robin says, now it's kind of down an octave. Oh, it's deeper, it's darker. Much deeper. So it's still a little bit Yeah, yeah. this one's slower speed is very slow. 2.4 centimeters a second. That's very slow. Play it. That's right, yeah, yeah. The lowest note. It's in the draw now. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's the number of sound waves per phase. Yeah. So if you increase the phase, you decrease the number of sound waves. So your frequency drops. If between there and there you had 10 peaks in your frequency and you stretched it to twice the length, you would still have 10, but they would be over double the time. So in the old days, it was completely impossible. The studios were so fundamentally complicated that nobody could actually do it. This was one of the troubles when, with Brian Hodgson and Dina Derbyshire. I had this very good studio. It was the only computer in the world operating electronic music equipment. But only I could actually do it. And I didn't really want to do it. I wanted to, to change it and make something newer and better. So each day I sort of dismantled things, put it together, because the whole thing was very fast. Over a very few years it changed from a completely uh, manual studio into this um, computer control studio. This is the thing that a lot of like people like Orbital and people like that, they were like, it was their first electronic music they've heard. They've always used to people, you know, Bob Dylan, Mormon, and then out of nowhere this thing being beamed into them when they're like six and seven, it's like The boss man at the BBC said, it's impossible for electronic music to be beautiful until Delia came along. I used to work all night. At night, I could use all of the studio's equipment, but this loop I made in the middle of the day. It went out through the double doors and then through the next pair, just opposite the ladies' toilet and reception. The longest corridor in London with the longest tape loop. The feeling of it growing quite slowly. When you hear it for the first time when it's put together, it's such a delight. All this that you see here should impinge upon the emotions and feelings directly. And this was Delia's kind of uh, back catalogue of music. When you play that to children now, um, it's a very, very different sonic sphere to the environment they're born into. And the environment that the internet kind of, that they're all kind of constantly connected to, develop, has developed for them. Um, it's a very kind of, it, it really does help you, it reminds you how much of a focus Delia has on a very personal and um, inward looking nature of electronic sound in many mm. ways, I think. And she really brought the, 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 the human nature of electronic sound to electronic sound in mm. some ways, because prior to that it was all, what was the, the performance of um, the, the, the famous one where, I can't remember, they, they've got this massive rack, well not massive, it's quite small by today's standards, they, and little racks in, they just set it up and go, no, I'm flicking the switch. At the Queen Elizabeth Hall in London, there was a full house of 1,300 people. 300 people turned away in 1967. And we gave a concert every year at the Queen Elizabeth Hall, and each time it was full up. 
It was it was terrific, and they were classical as well as 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 well as new pieces like Stockhausen, as well as Tristram Carey or whatever. And, but each time, these these um, Queen Elizabeth Hall, four at thirteen hundred people. So so I don't think that it's it's surprising that there weren't five thousand. I think for somebody who was a talented mathematician as well as being a talented musician, you would think that the product would be quite sort of sterile, you'd think it would be quite bland, but uh, actually the, the, there is something incredible about the music that Delia created, there's something incredibly organic and, and emotional about the music that she created. But with, with Delia it kind of, there is an element of, it's so, um, it does connect with you. It you, does. I, I, it, I it still kind of brings the two electronic thing, electronic which isn't connected to humans, but then it kind of becomes connected because of, of, of the way that she kind of creates her. Not way she creates some, but what she what what basically comes out of the speakers um, that she crafted out of these things that she recorded. And people sort of you know people start talking about our work being a bit like a seance or like some sort of weird thing happening because. We don't know where these sounds have come from. They must have been on our tape somewhere, but where? And what happened to your voices that we heard when we played them back in this one? Yeah. Even though we just... Izzy's voice will come laughing out of your tape. Yeah, that is a distinct <laughs> possibility, yeah. yeah. From that one sound, that could be enough to create obvious music, because when you want to create a complete piece of music, if you like, you want sort of your low sounds, your mid sounds, and then your higher sounds. So it might be that we start off with, then we call a loop, a loop with that by using this sound, so I'll just record a little rhythm. There's a little loop, that could be a rhythm, sort of bass line kind of loop, and then we can just loop that, and then we can do another one. We'll go back actually and we'll duplicate that. We can duplicate that track. So again, this is loads quicker. It took Delia 40 days to make the Doctor Who theme. It took me a day to do a very rough and ready <laughs> modern digital version of the Doctor Who theme. So um, now we've got that lower sound, if you like, we can put something in on top. Let's pitch it up just a little bit. Something with that. It could just be the... And it, I mean, so basically our lives are a combination of just improvising with this this bank of materials and, and a question of very simple we're just changing speeds mixing uh, effects eqing it's very i mean you can tell this that mixing this is quite sad, quite straightforward but the weird thing is how strange you can make it you lose things with tape it starts to transform you like already you're sort of you take a sound that you know what it was when you recorded it, but after a few passes around the loop, you're like, what was this again? Where did it come from? Where did it come from? I was always very generous in telling people everything I knew. I would collect everybody. I took Pink Floyd there in a taxi. I did a film soundtrack for Yoko Ono while she slept on my floor. I did the Doctor Who theme music mostly on the Jason Valve oscillator. Ron Grainer brought me the score. When he heard what I had done electronically, he'd never imagined it would be so good. He was tickled pink. I did rebel against a lot. I've always been a very independent thinker. The standard narrative is she becomes increasingly disillusioned at the BBC in the early 70s. It's not an easy time there. Desmond Briscoe, the manager of the Radiophonic Workshop, writes a letter to senior BBC personnel in the early 70s, basically saying the workshop isn't fit for purpose. He says, I've got staff taking annual leave early. Um, you know, they're not well. The increasing amount of commissions, the workload, and in a way the workshop were becoming victims of their own success. Because as more and more producers and directors for the BBC became aware of what they could do, more people were going to the workshop and uh, wanting to use their skills, their expertise. 
so she left. Something serious happened around 72, 73, 74. The BBC went out of tune with itself. They seemed to be dead scared of anything that was a bit unusual. I didn't want to compromise my integrity any further, so I left. When she left the BBC, she makes her way north, up to the borders of Scotland and England and she settles in the village of Gilsland. She went up there to become a radio operator for land pipelines. And there are the reports of people who work with her who said she um, was brilliant at the job and that everybody who worked with her respected her and her abilities and skills. It just, it doesn't fit with the narrative of what, what you know, many people think an artist should be doing. And that idea that when she goes up north, that these are, these are lost years, these are failed years, rather than see, it, that denies her agency, it denies her, I'm making the decision, I don't want to do that anymore. While she's up there, she married a, a local labourer, David Hunter. This was not a happy relationship by all accounts. And she moved instead, several miles away from Gilson, to the hamlet of Banks, which is right beside Hadrian's Wall. And there she worked and lived in the LYC Museum and Gallery. Now, the LYC was this extraordinary community art centre established by the Chinese-born artist Li Wan Chia. And she's there across 1976 and 1977. And she has to manage the place now, Lee had been visited a couple of times by various journalists and things wanting to report about, you know, what, what, was this, what was this magical place? And you look at some of the newspaper reports and they say, this is incredible, but he desperately needs somebody to help him run this place. And Delia is perfectly suited to doing this. Before she joined the Red Funnet Workshop, when she first joined the BBC, she was a studio manager. And so she would be liaising with the artists, booking them in, helping to, you know, with, the, with exhibiting them. Um, she exhibits uh, while she's there, Madeleine Hoycastle and Elsa Stansfield, people she'd already worked on previously. So this is not this, you know, for, to pitch this as being this, she, you know, she's gone into the wilderness. And it's not really the wilderness. There's still a lot of myths, rumours and erroneous notions about, about what happened to her. And the main one is this sense that she did absolutely nothing at all, or this slow decline. And it's often pitched as the Times did a piece on her in 2008. And it's, it was sort of Delia Derbyshire, um, composer of Doctor Who theme tune, um, sort of uh, radiophonic workshop, new people like Paul McCartney, uh, Brian Jones. But then also this thing that she left, became a hopeless alcoholic. Uh, did a series of unsuitable jobs and then railed against the injustice of, you know, of all of this throughout the rest of her life. That, that's essentially 40 years of her life. What was she doing all that time? So we, we got in touch with Madeleine Hoykas and she did two films with Madeleine and Madeleine's creative partner Elsa Stansfield in 73 and 75. These are two art films. Madeleine said, well, have you spoken with Elizabeth Cosmian? I said, no, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know her. Um, to my shame, and she said, "Well, I think I think you should get in touch with her." I said, uh, she said, "Because uh, I think she did something with, with Delia." And Madeline said, "I had introduced her to Delia, uh, to got in touch with Elizabeth, and sure enough, Delia had done a score for Elizabeth's uh, a forty-two minute art film, which was released in nineteen eighty. So this is seven years after she supposedly disappeared into the wilderness. But the earth is turning irregularly on its axis. Gradually as the years pass, it is slowing down. We have an unexpected clue as to the workings of time on the very long scale. Over the, the turn of the last century, the 1900s, music and electronic 
ideals from, from that period have become so integrated and part of everyday culture and life. And the way it's happened is is through people like Delia, isn't it? Mm, because of absolutely. One of the most significant composers of the last century, Luciano Berio, in serialist music, is connected to Schoenberg. Okay, Schoenberg's anti-tonal music is vehemently going against the tonality that was over-bloated and shockingly boring for the music listeners of those times, which was romanticism and Wagner. So that kind of lineage that ties down and, and is connected through to Delia Derbyshire and the Beatles and everything we listen to. I it's think quite, it's, it's very direct the lineage. I'm shocked that it isn't kind of more apparent. I think it's the desire and I think it's the drive to challenge. I think mm. these people, I think that's what's probably yeah, yeah. been carried on. It's the, the, you know, not willing to accept the norm. Throughout her life, she often wasn't getting the acknowledgement for those really major pieces and they were genuinely influential in a whole range of um, art forms, not just in music. I think you can, I don't think it's too fanciful to suggest that you can hear something of their influence even in something like Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. And one of the, the bittersweet things ab about Dita dying in 2001 is she lived long enough to know that people really cared and had been inspired by her. Being contacted by people like Pete Kember, John Kavanagh, Drew Mulholland, being aware that there were new electronic artists who she was just absolutely fundamental to their love. Um, and development of electronic music. I was expecting 10 people to come to see a projection on a wall. So hearing there was more people coming was always good for me, but Sarah, who runs the tin, it was her financial risk. So it was a bit worrying for her when the tickets weren't selling so well. Eventually, from slow ticket sales to on the night when there was 500 people here. We shouldn't have to be owned by the products that we buy and the sound that we create shouldn't be owned by that product. So a piano's always going to sound like a piano, but we kind of create our kind of context of the, the voice of us, of what we are, through it. It was important to us that everybody involved in the sessions were creating their own sound. Yeah, and, and they can have access to it as well outside as well, because. It's not just what they did in the session, it's kind of, for me it was generating that kind of interest of, oh my god, I can do this on my laptop, I didn't realise I could do that. And, and yet, and yet we're doing that, yet we're doing that, but I can't play musical Yeah, exactly. Yeah. She never, never knew that 500 people would be in, in, the, in her hometown cathedral being enthralled by her and have this legacy that she's now got. Unfortunately, never got to see anything like, like the evening that we, we did for her. I enjoy it because for me, I'm passing on my passion, my joy, my wonder and my dedication to what I do at the same time as I'm opening it up for them to interpret that and do what they will with that. And that's really something that's important to me is to trying to nurture autonomy and empowerment, not my agenda of what I want to be done at the end of five weeks. You know, it's, I want it to be on their terms and I want them to tell me you know, what they think. It was. I mean, we're both quite interested in how old technology can be used with new ideas yeah. like there's like obviously there's a retro element but it's more that these machines haven't finished what they can provide yeah. to culture yeah. she's an unusual woman in electronic music making this 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 thing in a, in a male world she's like a cool unusual thing hung out with the beatles and yoko ono you know it's like is this real like genuinely cutting edge figure that was cooler than everyone else. In the last few years, the Radiophonic Workshop, uh, some of its surviving members have reformed and they are, um, they've been gigging again. The love that's in those rooms when they perform is, is you can feel it. And in there, they make a point of featuring uh, Delia and they're also doing uh, collages of Delia's material, so that Delia's still very much part of the Radiophonic Workshop. It's very important for them that she is featured prominently uh, at the concerts that they give. And I, 
just think she'd have been absolutely thrilled to bits. She would have said tickled pink. Um, but, uh, and, and I think would, would, would have wanted to be part of that in some, in some way. Certainly part of the conversation. But I think she would have created something as well. Um, the world had caught up with her. I've put it all behind me. It's the doing of it that was the pleasure, really. I can still hear beautiful things in my mind, and I know how I can make more beautiful things, too. That's the important thing. Thank you.